faith from Hebrews chapter 11. And so I thought maybe a, a fitting conclusion to that series tonight might be uh, to discuss uh, from the Bible the nature of genuine saving faith. And so we want to uh, dig into God's word and take a look at that a very important issue this evening, spend some time doing that, and uh, hopefully help us and edify us, stir us up by way of reminder with some of these things that are uh, important and common to our shared faith together. And so let's do that, but let's begin first with prayer. Let's pray to the Lord and ask him to bless our time. Father in heaven, uh, thank you for our time in your word. We're so grateful to you for your word. Uh, so grateful to you, Lord, uh, for this sure and perfect guide. And we want to be um, accurate and faithful with it, Lord. Please help me as I preach. Please help us as we engage with the text to understand clearly what you're teaching, to apply these truths to our heart and glorify you, Lord, in living them out in faithfulness to you. So we thank you for our time. Please bless it, Lord. We um, need your spirit, God, to guide us into truth. And uh, we depend upon you for that, trust you for it, and pray, Lord, with the expectation of faith without doubting that you'll do just that for your glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about the nature of genuine saving faith, uh, the nature of genuine saving faith. And we have to ask the question. It's an important question. Uh, one of the most important questions that you can ask is what is saving faith? What is genuine saving faith? And that question, what is saving faith, intimately connected with the most important question that you'll ever ask in this life and ever answer in this life is how can I, a sinner, be right with a holy God? How can I be right with God? Uh, we have sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We've rebelled against him. And how can we, depraved sinners, be right with a holy God? How can I have my sins forgiven? How can I have the righteousness that I need to be able to stand before God uh, justified? And how can I, a sinner, go to heaven when I die? If you will, turn with me to, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And let's take a, a couple of look, uh, take a look at a couple of texts on this particular issue as we discuss the nature of genuine saving faith. Ephesians chapter 2. I know that we're very familiar with this text. Beginning in verse 8, where Paul explains clearly for us in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through the vehicle or through the instrumentality of faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're asking the question tonight, what is the nature of that faith through which we are saved? It's a critical, important question. What is the nature of that saving, genuine, real faith through which we are saved. If you look at verse 8, if the grace there, grace being feminine, the salvation have been saved is a masculine participle, and then faith through faith, faith there being feminine, it is the gift of God. The it there is neuter, and essentially what that's saying in verse 8 just to help you understand the grammar of this a little bit, is that all of that is a gift of God. So if the grace, if the salvation, if the faith by grace through faith, if the salvation by grace through faith are all gifts of God, not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast, then we want to ask, what does the gift then of genuine saving faith look like? What does the gift of genuine saving faith look like? A good way to think through verse 8 is uh, like this. Let me give you an example to help us with the grammar, right? If Jill and Tom and Sally all go to the store, Jill, masculine or feminine? Feminine, right? Tom, masculine. Sally, feminine. What's going to be the case of the all, referring to all three of them? It's going to be neuter. So if you look at verse 8, I know we're getting into a grammar lesson here. For by grace, feminine, you have been saved, masculine participle, through faith, feminine, that not of yourselves, it, referring to all of them, neuter. 
okay? Some would say that the grace is the gift, but the faith is not a gift. Faith is something that a person exercises in and of themselves. Or they'll say that the salvation is a gift, but the faith is something that a person exercises in and of themselves. But what this verse is saying, verse 8, is that grace, the salvation that is by grace through faith, all of it is the gift of God. So faith is a gift of God. And if faith is a gift of God, faith is given, delivered to you by God, and it's a gift of God, then what does that gift consist of? What does it look like? If Jesus authors our faith, and if Jesus finishes our faith, if he authors that in our hearts, and he finishes that work in our hearts, then what exactly is he producing? What's he doing through faith? What happens in us and through us through this gift of faith? What exactly is he producing? What does it do? How does it look, right? This question is of life and death importance. It is heaven or hell. And it's heaven or hell, life or death, because the Bible plainly and frequently makes clear that there is a kind of faith that does not save. There is a kind of faith that's no faith at all. It's a worthless faith, a useless faith, a counterfeit faith. Turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And let me give you a couple of examples of this from texts that we're familiar with. We've been working through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings, and I know John chapter 2 feels like a decade ago, but <laughs> hopefully you remember some of this text. John chapter 2. This question, what is genuine saving faith? What is the nature of saving faith? It's important to ask because the Bible is really clear and often teaches that there is a kind of faith that does not save. If you look at John chapter 2, look at verse 23. Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem, and he's there during the Passover. And it says in verse 23 that when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed... And that word is a word in the Greek that's used for exercising faith. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now what John is clearly communicating here in John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25 is that there is a faith which does not save. There's a way in which, a sense in which these people believed the Lord Jesus Christ and yet were not saved. It's interesting to look at verse 23, where John says that many believed, and then look at verse 24, where it says that Jesus did not commit. It's actually the same word, pistuo in the Greek. Jesus did not believe himself to them. It's the same Greek word, did not commit himself to him. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not believe himself to them or commit himself to them and trust himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. In other words, that gift of genuine saving faith wasn't given to them, okay? Look at John chapter eight. Flip a few pages to the right. John chapter eight. And again, we're asking the question, What does the gift of genuine saving faith look like? What does it produce? What does it do? What is the nature of genuine saving faith? And in John chapter 8, down in verse 31, you have others here uh, that are said to have believed. In verse 28, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, verse 30, many believed in him. So verse 31, and Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. In other words, if your faith is genuine, then you're going to abide in my word. If your faith is real, then you're going to abide in my word. And if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So Jesus answered them in verse 34, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 
I know, Jesus says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we are not born of fornication. It's a jab at the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desi- now remember, he's talking to those who believed in him, right? You're ever your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me, right? Same word. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Now remember when he opened this paragraph, he spoke these words uh, to those who were said in verse 30 to have believed in him. Now he's confronting them in their unbelief. Which of you convicts me of sin? Verse 46. And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Again, faith is a gift of God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we're familiar with this text. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Right? As, as, as long as texts like that are in the Bible, As long as Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23 is in the Bible, which will be forever. (laughs) His word stands forever. As long as that text is in the Bible, as long as John chapter 2 is in the Bible, as long as John chapter 8 is in the Bible, and many other texts just like that, right? Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower, and those who believed initially and then fell away. As long as there are texts like that, in the Bible, we must explain and understand and investigate and examine and assess saving faith. We must explain genuine, real, saving faith and expose false, damnable, counterfeit faith. It's life and death, heaven or hell. Make sense? As long as those texts are in the Bible, we have to take time and Paul continuously exhorts us, doesn't he, to examine our faith, to examine the fruits of faith, the evidences of faith. Many, many, many are mere temporary believers that believe for a time and then fall away, proving that their faith was not real, genuine, saving faith to begin with. So, so we look at the Bible and look at the Bible's record of what genuine saving faith is, what genuine saving faith looks like. The Bible often shows us glorious examples of the faith that saves by its actions, by its fruits. Now, the Bible describes what saving faith is, but often to see that faith, to see its evidences, to see its effects, to see the efficacy of that faith, it shows us glorious examples of faith, and we see genuine saving faith by its effects, by what saving faith does. And let's look at one example from Hebrews chapter 11. We took a look at this briefly. Turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 11, when we were going through the hall of faith and the sermon that Pastor Rick preached last Sunday evening. Really, Hebrews chapter 11 Sort of the theme of Hebrews chapter 11 is summarized for us beginning in verse 30 through the end of the chapter. Just gives us an overview of the effects of genuine saving faith. Genuine saving faith in action, what it looks like, what it does. We have these representative examples here beginning in verse 30, where our author begins by faith. 
The walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, what did their faith do? What did they do through faith? They subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. In other words, they endured persecution. They endured trial and difficulty. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through their faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, they should not be made perfect apart from us. So as we consider genuine saving faith together, I want to spend our remaining time this evening uh, drawing a distinction in genuine saving faith in two ways. One, what saving faith is, and then let's take a look at what saving faith does. We want to draw a distinction in genuine saving faith between what saving faith is and what saving faith does, and then focus some time specifically on what saving faith does. First, let's talk about what saving faith is. Saving faith is. First, saving faith is trust and reliance upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saving, genuine saving faith is trust and reliance upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not a nebulous concept. It's not ethereal or mystical. Your faith has a real historical object, the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who lives and reigns, right? Is seated at the right hand of the Father. The sinner embraces, loves, trusts, relies upon, depends upon, believes in, submits to Christ. And those are real verbal actions that the the sinner does in genuine saving faith. Not merely believing facts about Jesus Christ, you entrust yourself to Christ in all things. Not merely admitting you're a sinner, admitting you're a sinner is not enough. Admitting you're a sinner is not enough. Acknowledging that he died for sinners is not enough. It's not enough to merely recite some prayer, believe some mantra, walk an aisle, do some religious thing. You must embrace, submit to, believe upon, rely upon, trust, depend, obey the Lord Jesus Christ. We were witnessing to a woman yesterday, myself and a dear brother from this church, and we were talking to her, and um, she came to the understanding that she was lost. And said that she was concerned about that and fearful that she would go to hell. And uh, she knew, and she confessed that if she, if she were to die, that she would go to hell. And I asked her, well, do you want to turn to Christ? Does that concern you enough that you're willing to follow Christ? And she said yes. But then almost immediately said that she couldn't go to church because she worked on Sundays. So I said, well, here is, uh, and just using this as an example for her, right? What does trust in Christ look like? I uh, made the comment to her that this is an opportunity to exercise faith opportunity to exercise faith. What can you do? You can go and you can talk to your boss. Not that she's going to quit her job necessarily, but you can go and you can talk to your boss and see if you can have Sundays off in order to follow Christ. Now, if you think about that, a a small step, but an important step of faith, trusting Christ, if she's going to turn from her sin and trust Christ, and she said she couldn't do it. She was too fearful that she would lose her job if she even brought the subject up. Um, Genuine saving faith trusts the Lord. Genuine saving faith depends upon the Lord, relies upon the Lord, believes on the Lord, submits to the Lord, depends upon the Lord. Second, saving faith is trust and reliance upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
One, saving faith is trust and reliance upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, saving faith is trust and reliance upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sinner trusts in, rests upon, hopes in, depends upon, and embraces the all-sufficient, substitutionary, atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that work and that person alone. The sinner trusts in, rests upon, embraces, hopes in, depends upon, embraces the all-sufficient, substitutionary, atoning work of Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so the, the sinner trusts Christ for the work that he has completed for the sinner. Thirdly, saving faith is trust in, reliance upon, the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust and reliance upon the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord promises you in Scripture that sin will not have dominion over you. So what do you do? You exercise faith and you trust Christ as you battle your sin. He said sin will not have dominion over you. You will make progress. You will conquer it. You will be victorious by grace through faith. And the Lord promises that that will happen. So trust Him. Obey him, follow him, battle your sin. And while you battle your sin, depend upon him for strength. Depend upon him for help. He's promised sin will not have dominion over you. The Lord promises that you can overcome. You can overcome sin by grace through faith. So what do you do? You trust Christ. You call upon him for grace and mercy in time of need. And you battle. As you battle, you depend upon him. You trust in his promise that you will overcome by grace through faith. He promises to preserve you in the faith to the end that you might be saved. He promises never to cast you out, that nothing will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so what do you do? You trust him. You embrace those promises. You hope in him. You put your faith in him. You rely upon those promises and you battle. You rely upon those promises and you persevere. You hang in there. You don't throw in the towel. You keep going. So even as we consider now what genuine saving faith is, it's impossible, we can see in those examples, it's impossible to divorce what genuine saving faith is from what genuine saving faith does. This can't be separated, it can't be divorced. If you trust his promises, you pursue his promises, you rest upon his promises, you act in accord with his promises. If you embrace, trust, depend upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you live your life in the reality that that work, that all-sufficient work, applies to you and has power and efficacy in your Christian life. If you trust and rely upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you cry out to him for help in time of need when you have need, when you're facing trials, when you're facing difficulty. It's impossible to divorce what genuine saving faith is from what genuine saving faith does. So let's spend some time talking then about that. What does genuine saving faith do? What does it look like? Saving faith, saving faith follows Christ. Saving faith obeys Christ. Saving faith learns from Christ. Matthew chapter 11, the Lord says in verse 28, Come to me. And that's synonymous with believe upon me. Trust in me. Rely on me. Entrust yourself to me. He says in verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. But then after saying that he will give you rest, he tells you in verse 29 to take up his yoke. (laughs) Take up his work. Take up his burden, which is light. But take it up, right? Take my yoke upon you, and what do you do? Learn from me. Why? Because I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the Christian would say that his commands are not burdensome, right? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and what do they do? They follow me. What does genuine saving faith do? Genuine saving faith follows Christ. Follows Christ. Turn with me to James chapter 2. Just a few pages to the right there from Hebrews. James chapter 2. 
James makes this argument here for us in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. And James, in making this argument, beginning in verse 14, sets up a conversation with an imaginary objector. And those often happen in Scripture. We see that in Paul, don't we, through the book of Romans, other places. We have an imaginary objector here, and James is having a conversation with him, making a point, making an argument. So we want to trace James' argument as we look at James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. James begins in verse 14 with a question. He asks, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can such faith, or can that kind of faith, right, can such faith save him? The answer to the question expects a no answer. Expects a no answer. And he gives an illustration beginning in verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it, that kind of faith, profit? That question expects a nothing answer. That profits you nothing. Thus also, verse 17, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead, is useless, is worthless. But now someone will say, verse 18, this imaginary objector, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me, they knew me in the Greek, it's prove, demonstrate, right? Show me your faith without your works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, and he calls his imaginary objector here, oh foolish man, do you want to know, you foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. We'll talk about what that means. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So now James, when we think about this paragraph, James begins the paragraph by asking an extremely important question about the nature of genuine saving faith. It's the question we're considering tonight. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can such a faith save him? This is life and death, do you see? Life and death, heaven and hell. The question, his question, deals directly with a specific kind of faith. It's a faith that someone professes to possess. They claim to possess it. It's a faith by which they believe themselves to be saved. And yet that faith they claim to possess is unaccompanied by faithfulness in good works. It has no works hand in hand with it, do you see? It's a faith without, without action. It's a faith that doesn't do. Right? It's a faith that doesn't work. So what James here is not doing, we want to be clear, what James is not doing is he's not arguing that works must be added to faith. Do you see the distinction, the difference between those two things? James is not arguing that, that works must be added to faith. James is arguing that genuine saving faith is marked by, evidenced by, demonstrated by, seen by, characterized by good works. That's the argument that James is making. And that's the argument that we have to remind ourselves of and we need to understand clearly as we take a look at our own faith, right? So James begins a conversation then with an imaginary objector. And here's sort of the argument that James is making. If you look at verse 14, in verse 14, James is saying, faith without works is unprofitable. It is useless. It cannot save. That's the point of verse 14. In verses 15 and 16, then, James, making that point, 
that faith without works cannot save, he provides an illustration of this. In verses 15 and 16, one of you with that kind of faith, your words are making a covering, so to speak, for a lack of action. You're all talk, no action. Mr. Talkative, right? And what James is saying is what good is that kind of faith? For brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. One of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm, be filled. But you don't give them the things which are necessary for the body. What does it profit? It profits nothing. That kind of faith, verse 17, if it doesn't have the works, doesn't have the actions to go along with it, is a dead and worthless faith. It's no good at all. So if that all talk, no action characterizes your faith, you have a worthless, dead, counterfeit, damnable faith. You understand? And you can uh, insert your own illustration there in the same way that James does. James uses this illustration of someone who is destitute of food, and that one with that so-called faith doesn't do anything for them. But you can insert any kind of illustration here. I'm a Christian, but I never read my Bible. Can that kind of faith save you? I'm a Christian, but I don't pray. Can that kind of faith save a person? I'm a Christian and I don't bear witness to Christ. I'm not an ev- I don't evangelize. Can that kind of faith save someone, right? Insert your own illustration. Now James goes on in verse 17 then. Therefore he says, if faith, if your professed faith, if your claimed faith is unaccompanied by action, by works, by obedience, deeds done in faith, then that faith that you claim to have is dead. It's useless. It's worthless. So verse 18 then. Someone objects. They object and they believe that saving faith and good works are independent of one another. You can have saving faith and good works separately from one another. And that's the objection that's raised by the person in verse 18. So in verse 18, the end of verse 18 into verse 19, James's argument is that it's only possible. It's only possible to evidence or demonstrate genuine saving faith by action. Now, James is making the point that it's only possible to evidence genuine saving faith by action. And what should we, what should we do? What should you and I do if we profess faith in Christ? Should pursue action in accord with our faith, right? We trust him and let's go out and obey him. Let's do those works that are necessary to genuine saving faith that are characteristic of genuine saving faith. Otherwise, James makes the point at the end of verse 18 and verse 19, otherwise, your so-called faith is indistinguishable from the faith, the so-called faith of demons. One commentator said that it's a good thing to possess an accurate theology, but it is unsatisfactory unless that good theology also possesses us. In other words, we act in accord with it. We live in accord with it. Now, the demons, the demons of verse 19, illustrate the damning deficiency of a verbal profession. The demons attest to the damning deficiency of a verbal profession alone. There are many people who believe they're saved because they made a verbal profession of faith, right? I believe. They say they believe, they say a little prayer, recite a little mantra, rub a little bead, they walk a little aisle, and they believe themselves to be saved. But the demons here also believe in God. The demons also believe in Jesus Christ, and they know enough about God to shudder and to tremble and to fear his judgment. And considering that their faith has no works, considering that their faith is devoid of anything good, they should tremble and fear God's judgment. And so ought you if your faith is not followed up by action, right? If our faith is not accompanied by works that characterize good saving faith, right? Characterize genuine saving faith. If our faith is not accompanied by action, then we also, like the demons, should tremble in fear God's judgment. It's not followed with action. It's dead. It's worthless. It's useless. It's damning. So he repeats in verse 20, making his point. 
that faith without accompanying actions and evidence is a worthless and useless faith. Verse 21, Abraham's faith was evidenced by his work of trusting God. In verses 22 and 23, Abraham's faith was affirmed by his actions. If you remember um, the example in Hebrews chapter 2, if you just go uh, back a few pages to Hebrews chapter 2, we looked at this passage uh, not long ago on Sunday morning where it says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 that it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings alluding you might get the implied sense that Jesus Christ was made perfect by his sufferings but Jesus Christ is perfect. (laughs) He's lacking nothing in his perfections. He is perfect. So what does the text mean then? His perfections were affirmed and confirmed by his obedience and his submission through suffering. In other words, that our understanding of those things, the revelation of those things, was made perfect. He was perfected in that sense through his submission, through his obedience in trial, in difficulty. So when we get to James chapter 2 and verse 24... Abraham's faith was affirmed, shown to be right, shown to be, in that sense, justified, shown to be vindicated, shown to be acquitted of any fault. His faith was perfected, shown to be right through his works. Justification, which is salvation, justification, requires, if our justification is by grace through faith, then justification requires a faith that works, requires a faith that involves action, right? Justify there meaning demonstrating to be right, vindicated. If you think about Matthew chapter 11, this is a good example of a of an illustration of this to help us understand it. Matthew chapter eleven nineteen 19 says that wisdom is justified by her children. Now, what is it saying? It's the same use of that word justify in Matthew chapter 11. It's the same way that James uses the word justify here in James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it mean that wisdom is justified by her children? What it means that the validity and the value of wisdom is proven by the actions that arise from it. Right? Make sense? The value of that wisdom, the validity of that wisdom is proven... In other words, it's justified by her children, by the actions that arise in wisdom. So what does it mean here in verse 24 that man is justified by works and not by faith only? It means that that faith is proven. The man, his faith, genuine saving faith, is validated, is shown to be of genuine value because of or through the works that accompany the faith, if that makes sense. Just encourage you to meditate on that and understand that what's not being said there, we're not, we know this from the rest of biblical testimony, there's not going to be any contradictions in Scripture. We know that James is not here adding works to faith for salvation. This is a faith that works, a salvation that works, not a salvation by works. Then we see in verse 25, he uses again the example of Rahab, and he ties it up in verse 26, that faith without the accompanying works, evidence, and evidences and fruits, is a worthless faith that, faith that will not profit you. Now, there's no mystery. If we look at James chapter 2, no mystery what his argument is all about. Verse 17, faith without action is dead. Verse 20, faith without works is useless. It's dead. It's worthless. Verse 26, faith without accompanying works, faith without evidence, Faith without fruits is worthless. It will not profit you, right? No mystery as to what James's argument here is all about. So in what way, we consider the, the argument that James is making here, in what way is that kind of faith worthless? In what way is it dead? It's dead, it's worthless in the sense that it does not accomplish that which you want it to accomplish, which is salvation, right? Faith in Christ is intended to be the vehicle through which we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith. And so if faith is going to be efficacious, if faith is going to be profitable to you, right, if it's going to be genuine, 
then it saves. In what way is it dead? In what way is it worthless apart from works? It's dead and worthless in the sense that it does not save. In verse 14, it does not save. In verse 24, it does not justify. This then, faith and works, the works of faith, the fruits of faith, this then becomes a test. It becomes a marker, doesn't it? It becomes a test by which we can determine if our faith is genuine. A marker, a characteristic of whether or not our faith is real and saving. Apart from that, we can be assured that our faith is false, that our faith is counterfeit, that our faith is damnable, that our faith is dead. Genuine saving faith will produce works of obedience, works of faithfulness. As we trust Christ and we put our faith and trust in his person, our reliance and trust and faith in his work, and we rest and hope and trust and rely upon his promises, we pursue works of faith in his name in the strength of the Spirit of God. And pursuing those works, those obediences, we give affirmation. We give affirmation that our faith is real, that it's genuine, that it's saving. James here, incidentally, isn't contrasting two different options for faith in Christ, right? He's, he's not contrasting two different kinds of faith that are both different paths up the mountain, so to speak. What he's contrasting, he's contrasting a faith which is defective and damning because it doesn't produce works, right? We understand that. He's contrasting a faith which is defective, a faith which is damning because it doesn't produce works. And he's contrasting that with a faith that is genuine and a faith that is saving because it leads to action, because it leads to obedience, leads to faithfulness. Amen? So the question then in light of that is that we have to ask ourselves is what does my faith look like? What does my faith do? Those examples in Hebrews 11 that we've been studying for the last many weeks in our Heroes of the Faith series, those challenge us to examine our faith, right? There's a sense in which they encourage us. I want faith like that. I want to pursue uh, obedience to the Lord like they did, knowing that they're, they're a man. Moses is a man with a nature like me, like you, right? Rahab, a nature like you, a nature like mine. And look at what the Lord accomplished through their faith. Look at what the Lord did in them through the vehicle of faith. By his grace to them through faith, um, I want to pursue faith that way. And we can ask the question here honestly from the text of Scripture. What does my faith look like? Is it producing works that are commensurate, that, are, that characterize genuine saving faith? And that's the point here that James is making in James chapter 2 for us. Amen? Well, let's do that. Let's pray. A Father in heaven... Help us, Lord, to biblically and faithfully consider our faith. We know that faith is a gift from you, and our faith is not in and of ourselves. We exercise faith because, Lord, you've authored it in us, and you, having authored it in us, are at work in us and through us according to your will and good pleasure by grace through faith. And we know, Lord, that in that work that you've begun, uh, you will complete it for your glory, for our good. And we trust you for that. So help us, Lord, as we... Uh, look to Christ, the object of our faith, as we look to you, put our faith and trust in you. Help us, Lord, to rely upon you as we obey. Rely upon you as we follow. Rely upon you, trust in you as we learn. Rely upon you and trust in you and depend upon you as we love one another. Depend upon you and trust in you and put our faith in you as we serve in the body, as we love our spouse, as we raise our kids, as we read our Bibles, as we pray. Help us, Lord, to live this Christian life by faith. It's no longer we who live. We've been bought. We've been purchased. We have died in Christ. And now it's no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. And the life which we now live, we live by faith in him. And Lord, help us to do that. Strengthen us to do that. For your glory, God, for our eternal good. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.